I'll be bringing a, a Christmas theme message today. And for starters, can we all get a round of applause for Miss Jen for putting that together? Because that was pretty great. Okay, so typically we'd be going through the book of Ephesians in, a, in our, our series. We've been going through Ephesians. Ephesians. But we just did the Christmas play, so I figured I'd bring a Christmas message. So, with a Christmas message usually comes the Christmas story. So I'll read that in Luke chapter 2. Even though I just read it, we'll read it again and have it even fresher on our minds. But first, let's open in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day and for this nice Christmas together. And... Thank you for the time and effort that the kids put into the Christmas play and for Miss Jen organizing it. And thank you for the guests that we have filling the seats in the church today. Please help me, please speak through me and help me to know what you would have me say. Thank you that I have the opportunity. And thank you that we can all be a part of your family. Okay, so I'll start just by reading Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and if I was smart, I'd have put my bookmark there, but I didn't do that. And, okay, I don't get it. You'll probably beat me there. Okay. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. In those days, there was a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when, when Quintus, the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth of Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because because he was the house and the lineage of David, of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region there was shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good, new, good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among, the, among those with whom he is pleased. Um, I'll keep going. When the angels went away from them to the heaven, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made, they made known, saying that it had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered, the shepherds and told them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Okay. So that's that's your your basic Christmas story. And I'm not going to necessarily be, be speaking on the story itself. Rather, I'll, I'll be putting my, my message in correlation with the wonderful play that we just saw. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just, I'm using the Christmas play to give me a little bit of direction. 
So the, the main thing that stood out to me about the Christmas play was the family aspect of Christmas. Yeah, just, just me? Did, any, did anybody? Thank you. So the family aspect of Christmas. Most most of us here can so agree family, family is a very important part of Christmas, right? Most most of us here can so agree family is a very important part. Of Does anybody want to offer any any opinion as to why their own personal opinion? Love. Love. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Joy. Joy. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay, so I find that the world is an increasingly busy place and people run around all year long and they're super busy and they're thinking, they, they can oftentimes be thinking pretty selfish thoughts. I think this, I think that, I want this, I want that, I think this is right, I think this is wrong, and on and on it goes. So a lot of people take Christmas off and they take time to just get away from all the busyness and they take time to spend with their family, socialize. And, and I'd, say, I'd, I'd say they like to do that because families provide security for each other. And maybe you're looking at each other going, you, you're looking down the pew at, at the rest of your family going, you provide security for me? Really? <laughs> well, well, we'll say it's a long-term investment. In the long term, families provide security for you. Um, let's see, I lost my spot. So that's why family relationships are special. They're always there for you, and they always love you, even when you don't necessarily want them there for you or want them to love you. Well, I guess you always want them to love you, but they're always there for you. And it's that steady foundation, that, that constant love that's there for you that, that is why most people like to take Christmas off, because the world is such a whirlwind of a place, and it's nice to just have a place to go and stand on something that's consistent even though sometimes it's a little crazy. Um, and there's, so, so families provide security. We, we, can go, we can go with that. And there's all kinds of statistics out there that, about how pers this, ex, this person grows up without a family, is this much more likely to commit these crimes, and on and on it goes. I don't really want to get into that today because I don't want to, but I'll maybe provide a little bit more insight as to why that might be, but I won't go into the actual numbers of it. Um, so so I, remember, I remember being little. It actually wasn't that long ago, but I actually remember being little and young at the same time. And... Um, I remember family get-togethers running around. There was always these these big kids. There, there were these teenagers. They're they're the grown-ups now, and I'm the teenager. But they they were the teenagers at the time. I was a little one. And I always remember spinning around the rooms and hearing different conversations. And one thing that always stood out to me about the the general opinion on teenagers is oh, teenagers are so insecure, and because they're insecure, they're rebellious, so what are we going to do with those teenagers? Well, so, so I, re I remember hearing that, and I really I didn't care. I was having too much fun to care. I was wrestling my cousins and whatnot, but um, that But um, those, those, those insecure teenagers are the adults now. And they're out there in the world, and they're making decisions. And the funny thing about decisions is decisions always come with consequences. And it's one thing when you're, when you're little and your consequences only really affect you directly. But when you're an adult and you're, you're, you're out there, your decisions influence the entire world. So it's really important that you make good decisions because if you make a bad decision, the consequences are going to be devastating for the entire nation. And we see that today. There's, there's a lot of people in, 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 in our nation particularly that are 
making some bad decisions and it's influencing the whole nation. There's a lot of good people too, but our, maybe the bad. Our nation seems to be suffering. That's what that's what I see anyway. Their 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 decisions are affecting me, and I am I'm under the rock, so to speak. So another thing I I always noticed with the big kids is I always recall seeing well I and I do have some specific people in mind, but I don't need to mention them. But the big kids that or the teenagers when I was little, they the one thing I always noticed about them up front right away was the way they treated their parents. And I remember watching that and being, oh boy, if I talk to my mom that way, oh, I can't, I can't even imagine. So I, so I was there with my popcorn and I was ready to watch the, the consequences of those actions. And sometimes it was a little disappointing. Sometimes those big kids got off way easier than I would have got off. But, but that's, that's one thing I always, that's, that's another thing I always noticed. So, so a family, the, the thing about families is they hold each other accountable for their actions. A good family will hold all of their members accountable for their actions. And, accountability, and not holding accountability in a child's actions is going to be devastating because that child's going to grow up and they're going to go out in the world and they're going to feel like they don't have to be responsible for their actions. So they're going to go out and they're going to make bad life choices because they've never had to deal with any consequences before. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that the people that are out there in today's world, I'm not necessarily that are, that are making bad choices specifically, I'm not saying that their parents didn't raise them right or that they, they didn't have a, a good family life, I, I don't know that, it's not for me to say necessarily, but another thing is that a lot of times teenagers can be a little headstrong. They don't always like to listen to what their parents have to tell them. And so, and uh, I feel like personally I'm a pretty content teenager. I, I'm a, I, I mean, I, I'm definitely headstrong, but I, I'm a good boy. <laughs> and so, but maybe part of the reason a lot of the, the, the other teenagers that are grown ups now struggled with that is because for personal, they're they're standing they're standing on the edge of being ready to jump out in the world. And they're standing on that edge and they're they're still they're still on the side of the line. They're still their family is still responsible for them and holding them accountable for their actions. But they're so excited to jump out in the world. And deep down inside, they're a little scared too. But they want their, 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 the consequences for their actions to affect them directly. And so when their parents tell them something that, that affects them directly, they, they don't want to hear from their parents. They want the consequences to, to hit them straight in the face. But the thing about that is, is once you cross that line into adulthood, your consequences don't just affect you anymore. They affect the people around you. So I've been using the word accountability a lot lately, and I'm going to use it a whole lot more here. So, so I went and I, I got the definition for it, and this is Merriam-Webster's de dictionary definition, that, you know, the big, thick, thick, fat book that I hated growing up. Merriam-Webster defines um, accountability as the act of being accountable. You didn't know what accountability was before, you probably still don't. So, I went and I did a little further research. And the second definition Merriam-Webster ha has for accountability, this one's a little more helpful. Uh, Merriam-Webster defines accountability definition two as an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility for one's actions. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story. And this story, this is a story that my pilot mentor, Mr. Norval, told me. And, and it's a story of a propeller of an airplane. Everybody knows what a propeller is. It's the thing on the front that keeps the pilot cool. <laughs> 
So he's got this propeller hanging up on the side of his hangar wall. And I, it's, it's, I never gave it a second thought. It seems like a pretty, pretty um, standard thing for a, for a propeller to be hanging up in an airplane hangar. But for whatever reason, one day it came up in conversation. We were looking at it and talking about it. And there, he pointed out to me there's this little in one of the propeller blades. It just can't be any bigger than any, but it's a little bent. And he went, he went ahead and he told me the story of how, how the propeller got that dent. But um, this was before I had learned about propellers in my aviation class. But I saw that dent and I was like, oh, that's no big deal. A dent that big on a propeller is a huge deal because when you think about how fast that propeller is spinning, how much air is flowing over that dent, it really affects how that performs. And so the propeller with this tiny little dent, I was shocked when he told me that propeller would have been illegal to fly an airplane with because of a tiny little dent. So the, what happened to that propeller is there was this private pilot and I don't know, he lived in a big city, whatever. For whatever reason, he didn't own his own airplane, so he'd rent airplanes, which is a pretty standard thing to do if you don't have the resources or the space or the time to maintain your own airplane. So what he'd do is he'd, he'd go and he'd rent an airplane and he'd fly it around. And one day he went and he rented an airplane. And I don't know if he, if he I, don't, I don't know necessarily if he was going to a specific destination or if he was just taking off landing somewhere and then going back to his original takeoff point. But however it happened, he took off. He took off from, he had a multi-lake flight, basically. So he took off from his first airport and he was flying along and he landed at his, at his waypoint and everything went fine. Everything was as it should be when you fly an airplane. And I don't know, I don't know how long this flight was. I, I don't know anything really about this story other than how the propeller got the dent. So I don't know if he stopped and got gas and maybe got some snacks. I don't know. But he got back in his airplane to fly either to wherever he was going or back to the home airport. And he got in and he was he's cleared for takeoff. He's going down the runway. And just as he's about to take off, something happens. Maybe the airplane hits a bump on the runway. Maybe, maybe something bumps his elbow and he pushes the yoke forward. Maybe a tailwind comes up, which is pretty common in North Dakota, all of a sudden just a gust. For whatever reason, just as he was taking off, that airplane pitches down just for a split second and that propeller hits, hits the runway very lightly, just a, just a hit, but it made that dent. And the pilot got the airplane up and I, I don't know what he was thinking, but he probably didn't know the damage, honestly. So he flew back to his home runway or, where, or wherever he was going. He got back, he landed. It was he was pretty lucky that that airplane flew as far as it did. He landed, he got out of the airplane, he walked around, and he, looked, he took one look at that propeller. He decided he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So airplanes have got this logbook, and in a logbook you have to record, you know, the flight hours and failures and every, everything that happens. And in a, in a uh, rented airplane's logbook, you have to record who is renting the airplane. And so this guy, gone ahead and clocked in he was for for his flight but then when he took a look at that propeller he subtracted just just the five minutes the five minutes of when that propeller had got damaged and claimed that he was not responsible for the airplane during that during that five minutes when the when the propeller hit the runway and i get a funny mind picture when i hear the story i when i hear that he was not responsible for the airplane during that five minutes i picture I'm the passenger in an airplane, and, the, and I don't know anything about flying, and the pilot, he's taking me for a flight, and we're, and we're going down the runway at top speed, and all of a sudden the pilot just says, I don't want to be responsible for this anymore, and he climbs in the back and he takes it out. Now, that, that example is a little bit more drastic because the pilot is going to experience the consequences of that decision, whether he wants to or not. <laughs> but... Um, in this case, this, this pilot, he tried to get out of the consequences of, of an accident. It really was no big deal. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty common accident to happen in airplanes, from what I hear anyway. Just, just a little ding in the propeller. You, he'd probably have to pay for the repairs, but he tried to get out of it. And I think what happened, I think the FAA actually tracked him down and revoked his private 
pilot's license for a time and made him pay for the damages. So not only did he still have to deal with the consequences of his actions, he lost his privilege to fly for a while. So this is a really good example of lack of accountability. And he did, in the end, have to, have to take responsibility for his actions. Um, but, oh, I lost my spot. But that's where, that's where family comes in handy. A family's job, one of, the, one of the jobs of the family, is to hold the members accountable for their actions, like I said before. And the reason that's such an important job of the family is because when you're held accountable for your actions, you have to suffer the consequences. And the reason that's so important is because when you suffer the consequences, you're much less likely to make a mistake again. Now, in the, in the, in the pilot example, it was an accident, so it, it maybe doesn't fit that well. But Mr. Norville and I were just amazed at, at how he tried to get out of that. OK. So how does this apply? And maybe and yeah, I, maybe I haven't been all that Christmassy. So why is this in my Christmas message? Well, I'm getting there. This is the good part. We're getting to the good part now. Um, we, we've, we've already all agreed that family is a super important element of Christmas. Yeah? Yeah? OK. I'm going to make a statement here. And hold your horses, because I'm just going to make the statement, and then I'll give the explanation for the statement. But here's the statement. I would go as far as to say family is the most important part of Christmas. And you're all raising your eyebrows looking at me going, well, what about Jesus' birth? Isn't that the most important part of Christmas? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it is. I, but it fits. Because think about it this way. God the Father sent his son. Okay, we're off to a good start. We already have a father-son relationship, family relationship. He sent his son to be born into an earthly family. Okay, just a little tidbit, earth family. And why was he born? He was born to make a way for all of us to become a part of God's royal family. So I would say family is the most important part of Christmas. Um, let's see here. Okay, so you know what? I'm paraphrasing from another pastor that always asks that question. He's got a cute picture of a baby going, so what? Um, how, how does this apply to us now? God has given you the ultimate Christmas gift, and now it's getting Christmassy here. He's given you the ultimate Christmas gift, and that's the option to be adopted in his royal family. And now I've got, I'm going to pull up a slide, and it's, you know, uh, it's a, we're talking about the gospel message, so I'll pull up the gospel wheel, and Mr. Bobby, if, if you could, sorry for the short notice, if you could get that pulled up. I forgot to put the screen down earlier. No, turn the, turn the projector on. So this might take a second. In the meantime, I'll stand here awkwardly and quietly. <laughs> and hopefully I can see it because I don't have a picture of it here. Now, I'm supposed to have this memorized because, um, as some of you might know, some of you don't know, Colin, myself, and another boy named Heath were going to Summit, Summit, it's in what, Summit Bible Quiz, and what it is, it's a national Bible Quiz competition. And there's games and volleyball and stuff. And I've got more to talk about that later. But um, I have to have this memorized, and I have to present it to be allowed to go to Summit. So I figured I'd present it to you guys while I'm up here. So here we have, this is the gospel wheel. This is the, that's what it looks like. You, you guys can probably guess why it's called the gospel wheel, right? No? You don't see it? The wheel? I'm not getting nods. I want nods. You see the wheel? Okay. So here we have this vertical line, and that intersects everywhere where character is important. And here we have this horizontal line, and that intersects everywhere where, everywhere where we have action 
is where, where action is important. So we're going to start at the top with God, the character. See, we've got character intersecting with God, the character of God. And there's a couple verses for that. And that's Revelation 4, 8b. And I'm going to try and say these in the English Standard Version, but we'll probably get my versions mixed up. And 4, 8b is, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You've probably heard that before. And then John 3.16. Maybe you guys should say John 3.16. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. That wasn't the English Standard Version, but that's, that's how I would have said it, too. So, okay, so now we're going to go down character of man. Um, there's two verses that reflect the character of man. There's Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, and that makes it easy to memorize because it's 3.23 and 6.23. So I, I just like how that works out. But Romans 3.23, and well, I like how it turns out. I get them switched up, and I can't remember Romans 3 and Romans 6. And I believe 3 is for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 is for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Christ Jesus. Oh, eternal. In English standard version is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So now we're going to go to action. And there's, there's cross and trust, and this wheel goes counterclockwise. I don't know who decided that the wheel should go counterclockwise. That seems silly to me. But we have God's action towards man is the cross. So God's action is the cross towards man. And man's action towards God should be trust. So man, trust God, God, give the cross to man. And I'm going to do these two together at the same time because I really like the way they fit together. It's really cool to me. Um, for Okay, so for also the verse. For trust. Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And then Romans 5.8. Huh? Does somebody want to give me the first word? Mm -hmm. Let me look. I have it here. I cheated. Romans 5.8. But God shows, yeah, but God demonstrates, or demonstrates, the standard version shows. But God shows his love towards us in that while we were still sin in that while we were yet English standard version is still in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My grandma's gonna like she's gonna watch this later and she's gonna be checking to make sure I have it all word perfect in the English standard version for some of it. But the the reason cross the the reason cross and trust fits together so cool for me is because the cross was God's action towards man. And we all know in what way, right? God sent his son to die on the cross for us. The thing that's cool to me about that is he did it long before any of us here decided to trust him. So he made the first step. And he, it's just so cool to me that, he, that, that he, his action, oh, that's why it goes counterclockwise. It just clicked. Because <laughs> you read from left to right and the cross was the first step. It was the first action. That's cool. <laughs> okay? So, because he did that long before we decided to trust him, the least we can do is trust him after we've decided to accept him. That's, that's the least we can do. And then we have, of course, our, our character and the action it sets, and that's the center of the wheel. And it's, it's just got a verse. It doesn't have a special name. It's just got a verse. And it's verse Corinthians, excuse me, 15, 3 through 4. And this one's hard for me. The wording for this one is weird. For I delivered unto you that of which I received of first importance, that Christ died. And I always said, according to the scriptures, that's not the English Standard Version. That, what is the English Standard Version? That Christ died for us in in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that's just, that's, that is the summary of the gospel message, and that's why it's at the center. Anyway, that one isn't as cool to me as 
have trust and cross correlate, but it is still important. Okay, so recap the gospel message. Man, for, so man, the two verses for man show us two things. Two verses, two things. The first one is that we really, really, really need to be a part of God's family. And the second one is we are really, really, really not worthy to be a part of God's family. And trust. Trust, well, okay. Trust is just trust. Simple, simple as that. Trust God. It's the least you can do after all he's done for you is to just trust him to keep doing it. Uh, I skipped with God. We'll go to God next. God gave us the ultimate Christmas gift. And, and it's an adoption into his royal family. The thing is, we have to accept it. You have to see that, that Christmas gift under the tree. You have to tear off that bowl and you have to go dig it through the box and you have to accept it. You have to commit to it. And, and like in our Christmas play, that, that's a, it's a non corrosive Christmas gift. It lasts all year long and forever, as long as, long as you've accepted him and, and trust him. Um, and then the cross. I've already gone into the cross plenty, so it's just so cool that, that he did that for us long before we, we, I don't know why that's so cool to me, but long before we ever decided to trust him, he, he, he bought the present in July and he already wrapped it and he already put the bow on it and he already put your name on it and he set up the Christmas tree already and he's got it under the present and he's had it waiting there for you for, for all this time. Okay, so I'm going to start wrapping things up now. It's Christmas time. There's, Christmas time is such a wonderful time. There's, there's family and there's friends and there's presents and there's lights and there's decorations and there's food and there's, there's nativity scenes and there's Christmas play and there's all kinds of, of fun Christmas traditions. And it all, I've, I've, it goes back, goes back to my bold statement, I'd say it all revolves around one thing, and that is the concept, not necessarily my relationship with my family or my relationship with my church family or my family relationship with God. It, it's all of those put together. It all relates to the general concept of what family is and how it applies to Christmas. Now, personally, so, so here's the takeaway, as Mr. Doug would say. This is the, the mic drop. Um, I'm not a super emotional, Hallmark movie, lovey-dovey, Christmas magic person. I don't really get it into that. I still, I, I think I still have a really good deal of Christmas spirit in me, but, I, but I'm not super flirty about it. <laughs> but Christmas is a very special time of the year. And when we're, we're thinking about all, we're, when all of these things, all of these, all of these important matters are fresh on our mind at Christmas time, the least you can do when you're remembering that you're a part of God's family and how incredible that is, the least you can do is show a little bit of love to your biological family and your church family and your neighborhood family. It, it won't kill you. Even though you're not, even though I'm not a super social person, it won't kill me to be a little expressive. Because God expressed Himself thousands of years before I decided to accept Him. So we'll close in prayer, and then I've got some announcements. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day and for giving me this opportunity to speak for you. I hope that what I've said today will make a difference in the lives of the people where they need it. And thank you again for the privilege for me to come up here and speak, and thank you for the Christmas play going well. That was really a special event. And, and. Okay, bulletin announcements. Okay, so let's see here. I'll just go through the normal bulletin first, and then I've got my own special Clayton announcement. 
Heritage Baptist Church. Why not? Oh, my not deacons. Okay, well, I don't usually read this. I've never read the bulletin before, so this is a new experience for me. Welcome guests. I see some new faces. Well, yeah, I see some new faces today. We love guests at Heritage Baptist Church and appreciate you being with us today. Our prayer is that you will find a warm, friendly welcome. Oh, find, find, our prayer is find a warm, friendly welcome, and you will receive from God, uh, I skipped a line. You will receive a blessing from God's word as you worship with us today. When you have the opportunity, please fill out a guest card to let us know a little more about, us, uh, about you. Sorry, you don't have to let us know about us. You let us know about you. Just drop it in the offering plate. Our mission to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all who hear might be saved. Weekly schedule. Sunday is at 9.45 a.m. is Sunday school, and 10.45 is the nor a.m. is the normal worship. And then we've got Wednesday's Awana at 6.45 p.m. Um, and then we've got a, a little verse here. It's Luke 2, 10, 11. Hey, I already read this. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ our Lord. And that's Luke 10, 2, 10 through 11. Preaching schedule, upcoming events and announcements. Here's the preaching schedule. It's in your bulletin. Please be in prayer for these men as they study God's word and prepare to bring us his message through the book of Ephesians. Okay, I took a break from Ephesians, and I think it's Mr... Let's see, is my name on this list? Or did they update it? Update it. I think it's, it's Mr. Bobby next, right? Today's the 10th. Mr. Bobby's on the 17th. I don't know if Mr. Bobby's going to go back to Ephesians, if he's going to do a Christmas message, message. You're going back to Ephesians? Okay, he's going back to Ephesians. Mr. Jamie might be doing a Christmas message, because that's Christmas Eve. So I'd, I'd be a little surprised if he didn't, but he doesn't have to. It's, he, he can surprise me. That's okay. And then December 31st is Colin. I don't know what he's going to do. New Year's, maybe? New Year's, Eve, New Year's Eve. There we go. January 7th, we'll probably be back to Ephesians by then, is Chris Burt, my dad. January 14th is Mr. Paul. January 21st is Mr. Doug. Missionary update. Okay, I better get water before I get this because my throat's getting sore. Usually don't talk this much. Okay. Our missionary update this week is from Brandon and Beth Fisher, our missionaries to Hoosley, Alaska. Kids Club has been going on for a couple months now, and through the group of third and fourth grades, that sound right? A couple months now, oh, it is right. And through the group of third and fourth grades are almost are, are, okay, I get it, third and fourth grade are the most hyper, and they can also be the ones most interested in the words of God. During this time when Beth share, during the time when Beth shares the Bible story, they have been, they have been known to use the rest of their game time to continue asking questions about the story and other Bible-related topics. That's that's pretty impressive. I'm when I was in fourth and fifth or third and fourth grade, I'm not sure I'd have done that. I'd have, I'd have gone to game time. This is not an every week thing, but praise God for their interest in what God has to say. And has stepped up and has been leading the game, has been leading game time and helping to manage the kinder kin that's a weird word. It's kindergarten. Kinder is that kindergarten? Yes. That's how that's spelled? Apparently, I didn't learn to spell in kindergarten. Um, kindergarten. Uh, where'd it go? First and second grade. Uh, helping manage kindergarten, first and second grade group. It is a learning process in which she 
is grown, growing, and doing quite well. It is a joy to see her take this on and be able to example and is able to be an example to those younger than herself. Um, that's it, right? I'm not missing anything. The creation moment looks interesting. There's a, I don't, I didn't read it yet. It looks like, a, looks like the picture is something out of my biology book. It's called, Why Do We Sigh? And I've got one last announcement to make. So in the, in the teen room in the back, well, okay, I already mentioned myself, Colin Robson, and the, another boy who comes here on Wednesdays for Awana, Heath Drenkshul. The three of us are going to Awana Summit, the National Bible Quiz competition. It's in Virginia this year. And we've been studying hard, and my grandma's been trying to put together funds for getting us there, because our, our, our team name is usually the widespread witnesses, because we ha we're, we're the North Dakota. We're from North Dakota. There's me, Heath. There's us three boys from North Dakota. There's kids in Colorado, and there's a big group in Idaho, and there's, last year we had a couple from Utah. It, we're, we're all over the place, but this year, we're, we're, my grandma's been putting together funds, and one fun thing that she did was she put together a versathon. And maybe you don't know what a versathon is. It's, it's, it's a fundraiser, but it also encourages us to study for our summit memorization at, at the same time. So, uh, in the back, in the teen room, on the table with the red tablecloth, the teen saints table, back there on that table, there's, there's these uh, pieces of paper, and they're just, uh, one of them, I, I wrote in some examples. Um, but basically what this is, is you can pledge us X amount of points, X amount of money, cents or dollars, I don't know, X amount of money per point you make, or you can just pledge us a flat rate if you want to if you want to donate to get to get Colin and Heath and I to um, Virginia so we compete and then get us housing so that we can, can it's a several day event and then get us to fly back so we're not stuck there. We like coming back to you guys. <laughs> and then so what you do when you fill this out and I've I've mine I wrote in I've already got some family members to pledge me. So I went ahead and wrote those in as examples. But what you do is you put your name, and you put your phone or your email address so that we can contact you. And then there's columns, and you can fill out, excuse me, you can fill out whichever one you want. It's and they say pledge, per, pledge perverse or fixed pledge. And pledge perverse is for every amount of points that we make during the versathon. So the versathon is open. Um, I don't know. It's already open, and then it ends in. January, ends sometime in January, and during that time, it's our mission to memorize as much of the summit stuff as we can and then repeat it to one of our pledged leaders, and then they'll record, keep track of how many points we have by the time the verse is on close. So Heath and I already have 10 points. My personal goal is to get 200 points, and that's, that's, that's set for pretty high. I don't think most people go for that high. That's my first rule. Heath, Heath and I are at 10 points. Colin, you're slacking. You don't have any points yet. But anyway, it's not all just about points. If, if, if you want to just pledge a fixed amount, you say you want to donate a million dollars to our cause, you just, you just write in, you try and fit in as many zeros as you can in the fixed pledge column, and then and then the last column is uh, your preferred method of payment, which is check or cash. And you can just write check or cash. Or you, if you don't care, you can just write either one. So, so that's, that's that. And that's our own little special summit announcement. And that is all I have for you today. So close in prayer. Jesus, thank you again for this day and this opportunity. And for the Christmas weather and this Christmas season and the opportunity to reflect on what you've done for us in this Indian family and the incredible means that you went to to get to allow us to be invited into your family. We pray to you and thank you.